Welcome to the BCIS 1305. This is Dr. Schuster again, and today's topic is networking, or communications and networks. And uh, it's chapter 10 in our text if you're playing along at home, and it's a, it, it's a, an interesting chapter, at least I think it is. I really like networking stuff. Uh, it, it does cram an awful, it's not necessarily the best chapter, it does cram an awful lot of information into a single chapter. Uh, these are topics that you could cover over an entire semester or several semesters of content, uh, but they do do cram a lot of stuff into a single chapter. So let's go ahead and dive on in and, and see what uh, we're looking at today. So the objectives overview, we're going to discuss the purpose of the components required for successful communications and identify various sending and receiving devices. So we're going to talk about some of the hardware components that, that allow those ones and zeros to travel back and forth. We're going to talk about some of the distinctions, some of the different types of, of configurations, if you will, um, and, and how they're, they're, they're broken up, broken up and, and described. There's several different ways of doing that. So we'll talk about LANs and WANs, et cetera. And we'll talk about client and server and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the topologies of network, uh, star networks and buses, and et cetera. Those are all different perspectives or different ways of thinking about computers, and so we'll talk about some of those. We'll talk about some of the various network communication standards and protocols. There's lots and lots and lots of standards and lots and lots and lots of protocols. There's really only a few, though, that are really well-known, really in, in our, our everyday lexicon in terms of, of, uh, of networking. Um, we use a lot more than we really talk about, but We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. We'll talk about the purpose of communication software. We will describe various types of communication lines and the physical uh, media that those ones and zeros go across. We'll talk about commonly used communication devices, the different ways to set up and configure a home network, the physical transmission media, and we'll differentiate among wireless transmission media. Okay. So before we jump into it too much, what is communications or digital communications? It's the process in which two or more computers or devices transfer data, instructions, and information from a sending device to a receiving device. In other words, if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? Well, you've got to have the sending device, that tree falling, and you've got to have somebody actually hear it, uh, the receiving side of things. The, the, you got to have both of those, and you've got to have the sound. You have to have sound waves to be able for that sound to go from from a person. You know, if the tree falls, does it really does it make a sound? If nobody's there to hear it, you've got to have sound waves to be able to transmit that sound from the tree falling to a person's eardrums. So graphically, this may be what it looks like. You've got lots and lots of different devices. They're transmitted in different ways, whether it be a via a transmission tower, via, via satellites, via some sort of, of cabling, transatlantic cabling, for example. Uh, you've got to have some way of, of, of linking together those sending and receiving devices. <coughs> Related to this is the concept or the idea of a network. And a network is a collection of two or more computers. That's all it takes to constitute a network. Two or more computers that are connected together to be able to do something, to be able to share things, to be able to share something, whether it's communicate or, or sharing communications, texts, uh, um, email messages, video, voice, etc. We may be sharing hardware, so we may share a printer, for example. We might share data and information. We share files with one another on a network. We might share hard, uh, share software, so we, we have software that's loaded on a server and allows us to share that software with everybody on the network. We may use it to, to pay bills, for example. So a network is nothing more than two or more computers connected to each other for some sharing purpose. So again, graphically, this is what that might look like. Now I mentioned at the beginning that there are different configurations or different ways of, of thinking about the relationship among computers on a network. And depending on you know, how you want to look at it, it, it is you know really a lot of personal preference. But there are different ways of thinking about the the relationships between these different computers. One way is the geographic scope. How close are different nodes on a network? And I don't like the way the the slides jump around here, but 
Um, I, I really wish they'd start at one end and move to the other, but they do bounce around just a little bit. The one that most people are probably familiar with is what's referred to as a local area network or a LAN. It's a network that connects computers and devices in a limited geographical area. This is often going to be in, in your house, on a floor of a building, things like that. So it's a relatively small area. You can run cabling. You control uh, where you're going to lay the cabling down. You control all of that um, because it's a relatively small geographic area. So you have a lot of control over over your hardware, over your transmission media, all that kind of stuff. Related to this, especially in the home environment or small business environment, are wireless LANs. And though technically a, a different network, in most cases these are, are tightly configured with your local area network, so it seems like you're operating on a single, single local area network. But it allows you wireless communications uh, without necessarily having to run all those wires. Moving up in scope is something that's referred to as a MAN, a Metropolitan Area Network. When they, the book leaves out the, the CAN, which is kind of in between, a Campus Area Network. And a Campus Area Network is something you'd really typically see in a much larger environment. The example we talked about in class, obviously, is a campus, a college campus area network. Um, there's other examples, for example, Microsoft or Google, uh, some, some large organizations will have a campus area network. And it's, a, a, again, larger in scope than a LAN uh, because you've got lots and lots of buildings that are all connected, uh, lots of, of smaller networks that are all connected to, together in to configure and create this campus area network. But again, you have a lot of control over how cabling is run, where it's run, what type of cabling you want to use, all those types of things. Once you get into the wide area network, the scope is even larger still, so it's much, much larger. Uh, obviously, the best example of, of a WAN is the Internet, capital I. Uh, it, it's extremely large. It crosses geographical boundaries, crosses political boundaries, legal boundaries, etc. So it's much, much larger in scope. And typically, because of this size, organizations do not own or have the opportunity to own all the components that make up that network. They'll, they'll typically lease lines from carriers for, such as such as AT&T or Verizon or, or etc. Um, so that you don't have as much control over all the different components that make up the network in, in most cases. Going back to the other extreme end of the the uh, uh, of this type of view of networks is what's referred to as a personal area network. Some people will call it a PicoNet, um, and this is a, a, a Bluetooth network, very small, typically has a range of around 18 feet or so. Um, probably going to be less than that when you start thinking about. Um, um, interference and things like that. But this is what we, we're, we think about and this is what we're, we're using when we, we use Bluetooth, for example, when we get into our cars and our phone automatically connects to our, our car so that we can have hands-free, for example. Uh, or if we have Bluetooth printers at home or Bluetooth keyboards. These are small, very small networks that are very convenient and they're typically seen as a wire replacement technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to get rid of a lot of those pesky wires it's a very convenient to connect, but the range is really pretty limited on these types of networks. So that's one perspective of, of how networks might look. Another one is, is trying to look at the relationship between different nodes on a network. How are they related to one another? And there are other, other um, relationships than what they depict here in terms of just being client-server and peer-to-peer. But these are, are certainly two of the more common or most common ones that we see today. In a client-server network, essentially we have two scales or two, two levels of authority on that network. The server is at a higher level. It controls authentication to the network, for example. Who can log into the network? When can they log in? From where can they log in? Those types of things. Controls access to information controls access to devices, the printer, so who can print when, all those types of things. Controls access to files. So the server really controls all that stuff. The clients, on the other hand, are below that. They have to ask the server for permission to be able to access all those things. So the server is serving up that access, clients are consuming that access. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, you don't have those two levels. You have a single level. They're all equal, and they each control each computer on a, in a peer-to-peer -peer network controls access 
to that one computer, to itself. It doesn't control access to any of the other information on the other computers. Peer-to-peer um, -peer networks work great for small businesses and in the home environment. Um, but as the needs grow for an organization, as they become larger, a client server is a much better approach because it allows you much greater control over who's logging into the network, where data is going to be saved, all those types of things. So peer-to-peer -peer works great for small environments. Client server is much better for larger environments. Another way to look at networks is by looking at their topology. And, and topology is a little bit more complicated than the way they discuss it here in the text. Um, because we have a logical topology and a physical topology. In many cases, these are the same thing, but not all the time. Um, on, on the bottom left there, we have a, the, the star network, which is, is the most common. Um, and in a lot of cases, we have a hybrid, which is not really discussed here, um, where we tie together, say, for perhaps a bus and a star network design, physical topology to be able to, to bring different parts of the network together. But in general, a star topology is the most common. There are also bus networks, which you won't see that often anymore, and ring networks, which, again, you won't see that often anymore. Now, the downside of the ring is if you have a break in the wire, for example, uh, you have a break over here, you have trouble with devices communicating with one another. Same thing with the, the bus network. If you have a break in the cable, these computers here can't communicate with these computers over here. So that's a real problem. In a star network, though, if we have a problem with this computer or breaking the cable here, all these other computers can still continue to function and talk to one another, send things to the printer, etc. Now, the downside to this approach is your central device here, your switch or your hub, typically going to be a switch. But if your switch fails, the entire network is down. So a lot of times we want to build in redundancy. We want to have a a backup switch, something that, that automatically is going to fail over just in case that central device fails. But it's a very popular approach because it, most of the time the problem tends to be with an individual cable, it tends to be with an individual computer, and so it doesn't affect the rest of the network in most cases. So with all of that in place, we've got to talk about standards, we've got to talk about protocols. How do we think about the ones and zeros and, and, and get those to be transmitted and all that kind of stuff? Well, we do that with protocols. We do that with a way to code our ones and zeros in such a way that they can be interpreted on the receiving end. So in the next slide, I believe, gets into this a little bit better, makes it look a little bit better. But we have something that's referred to as a protocol stack. And what a protocol stack is, is basically it's a, a look at a perspective of the way protocols interact with one another. In other words, we don't simply use a single protocol when we're on a network, when we're on the Internet. We use a variety of different protocols that all work together to be able to get our data from one computer to the next. So, for example, at a very low level, we have Ethernet, and this is certainly the most common, but we could alternatively have token ring, for example much, much less common. Higher levels, we have both TCP and IP. These are separate protocols. TCP is a protocol and IP is a protocol. But they're very tightly integrated, so we typically see those, those together. So we have all these different protocols that work together that allow us to be able to send and receive data, and they work together to be able to do that. And they each serve a unique purpose. So here, and I would have thrown out the center part there, the token ring one, just because you're not going to see token ring all that much anymore. But Ethernet is by far the most common uh, um, local area network protocol that you're going to see. This is what you need for computers on a local area network to be able to communicate with each other. Um, they use the MAC address that's, that's built onto network interface cards to be able to send and receive data to and from other computers that are on the local area network. Once you get outside of your network, you really need something that helps you to both transmit and receive that data, as well as find the other nodes that are on that are out on the internet somewhere. And that's where TCP/IP comes in. TCP is responsible for breaking apart messages and transmitting those messages across the internet. IP is responsible for directing those messages to their destination. So this probably is a little bit more indicative of what you might see with a protocol stack. 
uh, the book doesn't really get into it, but there's something that's referred to as the OSI model. There's also the TCP/IP model, and these are representations that are, are pretty similar to what you see here. Again, a very low level. You have Ethernet, then you've got TCP and IP. You've got your communication software up here, which would, would essentially be your application layer. Um, and, and what happens is you go and you type in your web address in your communication communication software and it gets sent down and broken into TCP packets and, and IP packets and it gets sent down to Ethernet, gets sent across the wire to the receiving end at which point it moves up the protocol stack to the web server for example retrieves the page that you want and back down over to the client. And that's kind of how that process works from a very high level perspective. Um, but as I said, we have lots and lots and lots of different protocols. We've got Wi-Fi, we've got Bluetooth, Ultra Wideband, Infrared, RFID. These are all different examples of different protocols that get used for different things. So RFID, for example, uh, it, it is, uses radio waves to be able to communicate with tags. Um, <clears throat> we'll see this in the next few slides. Uh, RFID has several different examples. It can be used for inventory control. It can be used for for uh, um, toll tags, for example. Most people are familiar with Wi-Fi. At some point, we, we've used Bluetooth in some way, shape, or form. So we use all of these different standards and different protocols on a regular basis. So again, there's a graphical representation of how RFID might look in practice. <clears throat> Another protocol, Near Field Communications, it's based on RFID uses very close range radio signals and allows you to easily be able to share things. You can share contacts on with NFC uh, enabled phones. You can share contacts, you can share images, things like that very easily just by placing the two devices very close together. Um, another type of wireless standard is WiMAX 802.16 as opposed to 802.11. Um, much greater range than you typically have with Wi-Fi. With Wi-Fi you're really limited to a few hundred feet, uh, especially when you start talking about getting into buildings and with walls and all those types of things. WiMAX has a lot greater range, up to about 30 miles, depending on obstruction and stuff like that. Um, with fixed wireless, you have, you're have you probably going to be closer to that 30 mile range. With mobile wireless, that range is going to be a lot less. Um, but this is really good for applications where you might have a, a remote town or remote customers that are out in in a, a smaller community that are outside of a metropolitan area. It's a, 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 an efficient and effective way to get signals to them without necessarily having to purchase uh, um, lines or, or lay cabling or anything like that, which can be expensive. As consumers, we want to be able to access all this stuff through some sort of software. And the communication software can consist of programs and apps that help users establish that connection. They help them manage that connection, manage that transmission of data, send and receive, etc., and provides that user interface to be able to do so. So think of your email client, for example, as communication software or your, your um, chat program. It gives you that user interface. It manages that transmission. It allows you to connect to other users. That's the, the purpose behind communication software. And all those ones and zeros have to be put somewhere. They physically have to go somewhere to be able to, to send and receive that data. And how they do that? Well, it can be on a dedicated line. It can be through cable, DSL, ISDN, fiber. Fi well, I'll talk about fiber here in just a second. I'll come back to them in just a second. T carriers, ATM, and, um, asynchronous transfer mode. So there's several different communication line approaches that we can take. From a consumer's perspective, typically we're going to see cable and DSL. That's the dominant uh, dominant uh, alliance that we're going to have access to. ISDN is, is not something that's really used anymore. Um, ATM is probably on its way out as well, even though it's a very good approach. T carriers um, tend to be expensive, and the performance is not as good as, as, as they once were relative to other options. So it's those other ones, you're just not going to see that much. This FTTP, sometimes you'll see referred to in different ways. This is fiber to the premises, but sometimes you'll see it as fiber to the home. Um, and essentially, it's fiber optics that, that are run to your premises. 
And uh, typically you'll see unshielded twisted pair or something like that that comes out of it. So most of the time it's not fiber inside of your facility, but it is fiber to the premises. So they bring fiber right up to your doorstep. And uh, so you can end up with some very good speeds by doing that. So some of the different performance characteristics that you see from these different, uh, different communication lines. Again, cable, uh, uh, very good. DSL is really pretty good. Um, ISDN, once upon a time, was, was pretty good, but by today's standards, not that great. Fiber to the premises, really pretty good. Um, in, in all honesty, I get better than, than 52 at, at, at my house, so these numbers are probably a little bit dated, so that number is probably higher than that. And as I said, with T1s, for example, the performance just isn't where it used to be, relatively speaking. Um, when we were talking about the days of 56K modems, 28.8 modems, for example, uh, this was significantly better, but by today's standards, it's just not that great. Um, back up for just a No, that's good. Okay. Um, I wish they had talked about both cable here as well as DSL, um, because they're both important. Those are the ones you're going to see most of the time as consumers. Uh, so I wish they had included both of those here, but we'll, so we'll talk about cable here in just a second, but there's no slide for it. DSL, usually you're going to see as X dot, uh, XDSL, the X denoting that there are multiple flavors, if you will, of DSL. Most of the time you're going to see ADSL. ADSL, if you recall from the, the security chapter when we talked about uh, asynchronous uh, um, encryption versus synchronous encryption, I kind of gave you the clue, the, the hint that synchronous means same. You see that S at the beginning, it's the same. Um, asymmetrical encryption. Um, it is not the same, different keys. Well, asymmetrical DSL, digital subscriber line, is referring to different speeds. So our upload speed and our download speed are not necessarily the same, or they're not the same when we talk about ADSL. Um, this makes sense most of the time for consumers. Why? Because most of the time we download a lot more than we upload. If you send a request to a web page, for example, you type in www.google.com, that's a very small request. You're sending a few bits of text to the web server. But the web server returns back a lot more than just text. It returns back images. It returns back various graphics and, and it could be sound, could be could be video. Those are a lot larger. So we want to be able to download most of the time much more than we were interested in uploading. So that asynchronous or uh, asymmetrical, we're talking about different speeds up and down. Now, if you're a web server, uh, um, you're much more interested in upload speed because you're trying to serve that information up. Um, but as consumers, we're more interested in our download speed. We've got to have a device to actually place those ones and zeros in the air or on, on, on the line. And we do that with various communication devices. And there, there's several different ones, and they all interact and work together to be able to do that. So a communication device is any type of hardware capable of transmitting data, instructions, and information between sending a sending device and a receiving device. So there may be multiple ones between those two devices, and those are all considered communications devices. So closest to us from the consumer side of things are our broadband modems, uh, typically a cable modem or a DSL modem in most of the time. Um, and they're, they're, they're what allow us to send and receive data to and from our internet service provider. So uh, we, in terms of cable, we may have uh, a, a cable modem that connects to our, our personal computer or to our wireless, uh, wireless router that allows us to connect other devices to our network. And on the other side, it's going to be split out of a splitter that still allows us to be, be able to receive our television signals. If we happen to have a, a device that does not have a mobile uh, a Wi-Fi built into it, we can a lot of times use a wireless, a wireless modem to be able to do that or add that functionality to that device. Not going to see this an awful lot, but they, they do exist. Again, most mobile devices have this capability built into them already. So, <clears throat> Another communication device is a wireless access point. Uh, this particular one is just a wireless access point. Uh, you don't see any of the other connections, um, any of the other lights indicating that it also has a switch built into the back of it. 
Uh, so this is just allowing wireless devices to be able to communicate with this wireless access point. If you have two or more uh, uh, networks that you need to combine, you need a router. A router is going to connect two networks together, and that's the purpose behind a router. If you're thinking about your home network, you've got a wireless router uh, um, built or that you're using for connectivity in your network, you may see a, a configuration that's very similar to this where you've got, got internet access, you've got your cable or DSL modem, and your router connects to that, and then you've got multiple devices. Well, the reality is, is you are connecting two different networks in this environment. You've got your internal network here, and that represents one network. But then you've got an external network out here, and that's what the router is doing, is it's converting the address is internally to your network, to that external network outside of your internal network. And that's the purpose behind a router, is to be able to, to do that translation, to be able to connect two different networks together. On the computer side of things, you've got some sort of, assuming it's, it's a wired connection, here on the left you've got a network interface card. This is a, an expansion card, it's going to plug into an expansion slot on a, on a computer and the cable is going to actually plug in right here on the end. Now, in a lot of cases, the uh, network interface card is built onto the motherboard, so there's no expansion card to, to plug in. It's simply built onto the motherboard, and you plug in directly to the motherboard. If you have an older laptop that does not have a wireless uh, card built into it, but it does have a PCMCI, PCMCIA slot built into it, you have uh, express cards, for example, that you can use to be able to add that functionality to it. But again, you have to have some way to put those ones and zeros on the media. So how do we connect all those together? Well, this is at one end of, of that wired connection. In this case, UTP, unshielded twisted pair. We plug up to the back of our computer right into there. The other end of the cable finds its way into a switch or a hub. Now, that's so the cable is going to go from our computer, from the back of the computer, that network card, into our switcher hub. We can combine multiple switches or hubs to expand our network, have a larger and larger network as as we need it, as we need. Um, and that's kind of the idea behind a switcher hub. It allows us to connect lots and lots of, of devices together. Now, the reality is, is you're not going to see hubs anymore. It's an old, they're a much older approach. Um, and I'll just briefly discuss the differences between them. A hub essentially would operate like this, that if this particular computer here, this laptop, needed a file that was on this desktop computer up here, it would send out a request to the hub. The hub receives that information and then sends that information out on all the ports on this hub, meaning that this computer gets the request, this computer gets the request, this computer gets the request, and under the assumption that this is connecting these hubs, it's going to come into this computer as well, and assuming this is a hub, it's going to go out here, 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 here as well. So all these computers are getting that request. What happens is, because it's asking for this specific computer, there's an address on this computer called a MAC address, so it knows that the request is for it. This one has a different MAC address, so does this one, this one, etc. All of them have different MAC addresses. Because it doesn't match, these computers simply ignore that request. They drop that packet. This computer responds because it's the same MAC address. It's the one that's actually being requested. So as this network gets larger and larger, you end up with a lot of conversations going back and forth with all the computers. So hubs are not very efficient. Um, so as the network gets larger and larger, hubs really cause a problem. A switch, on the other hand, knows that when it sends a request for this computer, it knows that this computer is plugged into this port. So rather than sending it back out on every port that's on that network, or on that, 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 that hub, on a switch, it knows it's connected to this port, so it sends it back only out on that port. So it's a much more efficient approach. It allows a lot more communication to take, to take place. It's much more efficient. As far as setting up your home home network, you really want to be very careful about where you put things. Uh, you're going to end up with dead spots if, if if you don't think about where you're going to put your wireless router, for example, uh, in in terms of placing it very strategically. Um, 
If it's a very large home, you may need more than one wireless access point. If it's a, a moderate sized home, a lot of times you can get by with a single one. But you want to make sure, again, you, you really kind of place it in a very centralized location. Um, because the further away you get from it, you'll see your speed start to slow down. You'll see your, your, your coverage start to drop off. So um, be aware of that when you, when you connect things. If you have a wireless access point, you, you place it at one end of your house, you may have trouble getting signal at the very far other end of the house. So we've talked about the physical devices and the, the, the physical communication devices themselves. We've got to place those ones and zeros somewhere. So we talked about that cabling earlier that connects the network interface card to the switch or to the hub. What is the cabling that we plug in? That's, that's the transmission media that we're talking about. That's the definition of transmission media. It's what we're putting those ones and zeros on to. Uh, and if it's wired, it's usually going to be unshielded twisted pair. If uh, we do it wirelessly, it's usually going to be some sort of Wi-Fi connection. Um, there's alternatives out there to both, though. Um, another term you need to be familiar with is the term, term of broadband. Broadband media transmits multiple signals simultaneously. So when you hear this, think of cable, for example. You can receive your television signals as well as your, your, your data signals for your internet connectivity um, via broadband, via your cable system. Another term you need to be familiar with is bandwidth. This is the amount of data, amount of information, the amount of, of instructions that can travel over transmission media. Uh, and this is referred to as your bandwidth. The more bandwidth you have, the faster your connection is going to be. Another term you need to be familiar with is latency. And this is the time that it takes a signal to travel from one location to another. Uh, in theory, we're talking about electrons that are traveling at, at close to the speed of light. But as the distances get larger and larger, as we're, we're bouncing signals all across the, the world, latency starts to go up. It, it, it does take time, even for light, to travel over longer, longer distance. Um, so latency is that amount of time that it takes for a signal to travel from one location to another. So some of those different types of media, here's some of the, the different performance characteristics uh, that we have from some of those. Most of the time, you're going to see uh, uh, twisted pair cabling. That's very, very common. In particular, you're going to see 100 base T and 1,000 base T, or gigabit Ethernet. These are the most common. And the speeds are why 100 megabits per second and 1 gigabit uh, gigabits per second. Those are both pretty good. Very old at this point is the 10 base T, 10 megabits per second, and as is token ring. You're just not going to see that very often. Same thing with coax uh, from a networking perspective. Uh, certainly you still see it in the home as far as, as cable television, but as far as, as the, uh, the LAN environment, you're not going to see coax hardly ever. Um, fiber optic is a very nice choice um, in terms of performance. You can see down here your performance uh, can be very, very good. It also tends to be more secure. It's, it's harder to tap into a fiber optic cable than it is a shielded twisted pair, but it costs quite a bit more and uh, it, it's not quite as easy to run the, the fiber optic cable as it is twisted pair cable. As far as what these different media actually look like, here at the top left you see twisted pair. Twisted pair it refers to the, the cabling itself, so twisted pair consists of four pairs of cables, so eight total wires. The twisting allows the electrons to travel further down the wire without being affected by interference and things like that. So that's why it's an electrical characteristic. So that's why the, the cable cabling is twisted. Uh, we've got coax cable, which looks very similar to the same kind of coax that you have connected to your, your television. It's not quite the same, but it is, is very, very similar. And then on the right, we have fiber optic cable, which, again, most of the time we're not going to see coax uh, or fiber optic in a home environment. What we've talked about up to this point is guided media. The, and by guided, it's wherever the wire goes, that's where we have signal. If there's no wire, we don't have signal. So we can guide that, that media. We can guide the, the, the signal. With radiated media or wireless media, we have a little bit less control about where those signals go. If they're out there, they're out there. So it's sometimes referred to as 
as radiated media as opposed to guided media. Several different uh, options, uh, several different types of, of wireless, infrared, broadcast, cellular, microwave, radio, and, and communication satellite. Infrared is a, a, a light, um, so it's, it's a line of sight um, approach to sending data. Uh, often seen with television remote controls, for example. There were some other examples, some, some very early smart devices, for example, allowed you to send and receive contacts via infrared. But again, the downside is you physically, the transmitting device and the receiving device have to be able to see each other. If you get in the way or you break that, that light, uh, if you get something in the way and break that light, uh, um, the ability to light to travel between those two devices, you break that connection. So it's a, a downside to the infrared approach. Most of us are familiar with broadcast radio, uh, most of us with Bluetooth, or many, many with Bluetooth, but most of us with Wi Fi. Uh, 802.11a, G, uh, A, B, G, N, A, C, and, and A, D, for example, are very commonly used. Uh, our laptops, our smartphones, in a lot of cases, use those. Once we get away from our wireless access points, though, we're going to kick over to cellular radio. We're going to usually be on 3G or 4G, or perhaps 5G if you're one of the fortunate. Um, we've also got microwave radio. That's not something as consumers we're typically going to use. But this allows telecommunications carriers, for example, to be able to efficiently send signals over a larger distance, usually 20 or 30 miles, before they have to have another tower. Um, and this allows them to, to send signals at, at very good speeds uh, over relatively long distances. The downside is, is that they have to, to install and set up towers to be able to do this. Um, the upside is that they don't physically have to run cabling, um, so it can be can be a, a more efficient approach. And then we've got uh, communication satellites that are, are in orbit that allow us to send and receive data. So broadcast radio is a wireless transmission media that distributes radio signals through the air over long distances. So it's much larger than when we're talking about Wi-Fi. Uh, cellular radio is a form of broadcast radio that is used widely for mobile communications. Our cell phones, for example. And we just got through talking about a lot of this. There's those towers I'm talking about. The reason that we have a, a range for these towers, and this is probably not the best graphic because it really implies some significant distance between these towers, um, is that there's the curvature, curvature of the Earth. And so as a result, the curvature of the Earth tends to uh, affect the radio signals that are traveling from one tower to the next. So it's a, it's a problem. So because of that, we typically have towers that are located depending on, on the source that you're, you're reading, anywhere from 15, probably 15 to 30 miles or so, um, but the distance that you have between towers. We've also got communication satellites, which gets, you, gets used for a lot of different things. Uh, essentially, these, these satellites um, orbit the Earth in geosynchronous orbit, which means they stay at the same point. So as the, rotate, or as the planet rotates, the satellite rotates with it and stays at exactly the same place uh, hovering above the Earth. This allows us to do a lot of different things. Um, and the next few slides talk about this. Um, one of the most important things is global positioning. So it allows us to very accurately tell us, you know, provide us with directions, allows us to navigate uh, very easily. Um, and, and it's because of the geosynchronous orbit that, that those satellites have. So here's kind of an, an example and some of the different devices that can be used uh, using those GPS satellites. So this chapter, we talked about some of the various network architectures. We talked about topologies and, and, and protocols. And we talked about how there's lots of different ways of looking at the relationship that computers have with one another. We talked about the some communication software. And we talked about the, the user interface and how this helps you to to create connections and, and stuff like that. We talked about communication lines and, and some of the different communication devices like network interface cards, wireless routers, stuff like that. We talked about creating a home network and, and placement of wireless, uh, 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 wireless access points, for example, to be able to maximize your connectivity throughout, throughout a, a home or facility. So you know, if you put it at one end of the, the house, one end of your, your building, Keep in mind, that may make it very difficult to get signals on the other end. And lastly, we talked about the transmission media and wireless transmission media. So 
this is like I said, this is a, a good chapter. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, it probably could have been written a little bit better, but th they crammed a lot of stuff um, that really could be covered over one or more classes into a single chapter, and it's really tough to do. So uh, it, it, there's some good stuff in this chapter. Be sure and take a look at it. If you do have any questions, shoot me a message, send me an email, uh, follow me on Twitter, check out my other social media stuff as well, and, and keep up with what's going on in class. So other than that, take care. Until next time, have a good one. Thank you.